program, Johnny Morris paints a picture in sound of the island of Portland. It's really very difficult to describe Portland. Even when I begin to think about the place, the words that I thought would suit it seem to shrivel and dwindle tiny. Perhaps to describe it, you need a great lump of black charcoal and a thumping white tablecloth, and then you can hack and carve away and make the shapes that make Portland. Even then, that wouldn't be enough. Portland is such a brutal hulk of stone. Looking at it from the mainland, you wouldn't want to go there. It's grim, grey, forbidding. And in the early morning sea mists, it moans in awful despair. <laughs> But wait for the mist to clear a bit, and you can see it more clearly. It sticks out into the sea like the skull of a crow, and is joined to the land by the long, scrawny neck of the Chesil Beach. Let's walk along the top of the incredible pebble beach, the sea on either side. On the right, it's restless and worried, gargling in the pebbles. On the left, shipshape controlled and tamed into Portland Harbour. There lie the sly submarines like black alligators. But let's climb up from sea level, up this great mountain of stone, around the hairpin mountain road, and here, 400 feet higher at the top, just gaze for a moment at the gigantic pebble beach, the calm, well-tailored harbour, the gay sprinkling of Weymouth, and then turn and stride out across the island of Portland, the royal manor of Portland. When the conqueror came over here, he had a survey taken of all the country. And uh, Portland, of course, was included in it. And they took particulars of all the animals and the people and everything else and the acreage here. And he retained uh, small places like this as his own manor, his own right. Portland was one of his royal manors. He appointed the uh, steward to look after his interests and he kept just about 307 acres of land here for himself. That was cultivated by his steward and his bailiff. Uh, all around the uh, King's d d land was the common land, and which the uh, local people cultivated themselves, but they had to listen and give heed to the uh, steward of the manor who <coughs> would tell him when the planting took place and all that sort of thing, the reed rather. And uh, that was how it became a, a royal manor. Every sovereign has either been the lord of the manor himself or he has handed over to various people, like the Duke of Gloucester. Three of the wives of um, Henry VIII were ladies of the manor in different turns. But that was a purely an honorary thing. But the king has never relinquished his right to, to, to Portland. Portland, the royal manor of stone, the island of heartbreak, backache stone, the pale cream, beautiful stone. Since time out of mind, men have hacked away at this mammoth chunk for hundreds of years, they've scratched all over the island after the precious stone that lies just below the surface, and they've turned the place into an enormous chicken run, and they're still scratching away. Let's wander down the wide stone street at Easton and turn left up a bit of a stone track, and there is a small stone quarry. Just one hand crane, clicking his even teeth with satisfaction. And just over the brow is a vast up-to-date quarry. Look at the massive power cranes, like a herd of prehistoric animals browsing in a swamp. Listen to the greedy drills rattling and the hammers clacking and pinging with glee.
When I started work as a boy, we were about half a mile from here, and we've moved half a mile since that time. And uh, there was only one quarry in this area when I started as a boy. Now there are seven. Mm. So you've moved about a mile altogether? Altogether, yes. And this is the last place which I shall work, definitely. You think so? Oh, yes. There's enough here to see my life out or what I want. How long do you think this stone is going to last? Well, personally, as long as far as I'm concerned, it's going to last long enough. Uh, I'm not concerned too much for the next generation, but it will see them out. And what are those two men doing down there? Well, the two men down there, you see, if the, if the joints are tight, they, they put widgets, widgets in there, what we call big widgets in there, and they ram it off, and when it's loose, then they lift it or cut it, whichever they want it. What size are these blocks? Well, you may get a rock 50 ton. You may get one 100 ton, but uh, it's very rare now. You don't lift out a 100 ton one, do you? Uh, the, they would lift a 100 ton one from the bottom to get it off the bottom by putting in the, in the big widgets. I see. Um, then you get it up on top, and then what do you do with it? Oh, I'm up here scabbling. Up here what? Scabbling. Scabbling. Well, that's like dressing the stone, squaring it up. Mm. Because when it comes out of the quarry, it's what, it's, what, what sort of shape is it? Well, triangles, puffin shapes sometimes, we'd call it. Mm. All shapes. Unless you get a sound rock one, well, then you can cut it out square, you see. And how do you do your scabbling? Well, with the kibbles and the toy bills. Just uh, race it down. And that's pretty hard work, isn't it? It is hard work. Well, since we've had the, these plugs and feathers in the quarry, I reckon scabbling is the, is the, the hardest part of it now. Mm. What do you call the plugs and feathers? Well, that's... Uh, what we cut the stone with, you got like a, a chisel, wedge-shaped, and then you've got two pieces of uh, steel, round, cut in half. You make a hole, put that in the hole, and then drive your plug in, see? According to the size of the rock you've got to cut, so you've got to put, you know, different amount of plugs in and holes. Put them in usually about three inches, four inches apart. Or well, sometimes you might want 40 or 50 plugs to cut a rock, see? Depends on the size. Now, some, some of the gangs that used to work here, Alf, were, were sort of families, weren't they? Oh, yes. That's how it used to be at one time. Usually father and several sons, and uh, sons and their uh, uncles, you know. Well, uh, it was all families in Portland in them days, and uh, they all worked their own quarry sort of yeah. business. And they always kept it in the family. Of course, we um, took on with the firms. It's uh, like subcontractors with the firms, see? They like to keep the family in the in the money sort of fair, wouldn't you? Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. But that's died out, hasn't it, really? It has now. But there's still all Portlanders in the uh, quarries now, and still Portland, the true Portlanders in the quarry. Yes. Who do you work with here? Well, me, me three brothers. Yeah. There's Bill, Tom, and George. And how did you get on as a family? Well, we get our ups and downs, but we all work together well, you know. I think you do. You know, perhaps it's the hard sort of work that you do that keeps you together, do you think? Yes, I do, really, yes. It is our work, I know, quite admit that, but like every trade, if you can make it easy, can't you? I started in, at this trade when I was 14, as soon as I left school, and I've been working at this trade for 38 years. And I, I wouldn't wish for anything better. It's an outdoor life, a grand life, active life, and it keeps you fit. And, uh, well, financially, there's plenty of money attached to it. But a great hunk of Portland stone as it stands is about as much use as a toppled oak. It has to be sawn up, trimmed and dressed. Ever thought of sawing through a five-foot square block of stone? They do it with circular saws studded with diamonds, thousands of flying diamonds. The saws go screaming, tearing through the stone like a bacon slicer through a fat gammon. The diamond saws are accurate and fast, but the stone masons and carvers can only work as quick as their eyes perceive, their mallets tap, and their chisels chip, chopping, chivying the sullen stone until it flowers into a Corinthian column or grows proud into a dignified symbolic enrichment. I wonder how you'd start to carve yourself a colonnade. You've got to get the right men to start mm. with. Uh, these men, are all masons. 
They never learnt their trade as carvers. They were all masons. And they came to work with me and we've gradually picked up and built up and they are now carvers. Yes. It's uh, rather difficult. Everybody can't do it. You must have that creative eye to start with. You want to be able to see, when you start to do the stone, you want to be able to see it finished before you start. And there's, it's quite easily, the only thing you've got to do is to knock away all the stone you don't want. That sounds easy enough. But what sort of quality is this Portland stone? It's the best in the world. It's unbeatable. It's the best building material you can possibly have as a natural stone, of course. Mm. And of course, it will beat any uh, pre-cast stone. I don't think that would stand up to it. I like stone. I like working it. I like seeing it in the building. Particularly when it's weathered, more so than you, I think it beautifies with age. I always think that we shall always have Rolls Royces and we shall always have Portland Stone. I think Portland Stone is the, the Rolls Royce of all stones. Stone, stone, stone. You can't get away from the stone. A hard, brutal commodity, you'd think, but not to everyone. I think Portland is for watercolour, for me. I see it in watercolour. The reason it attracts me is because of the light and shadow, the sunlight um, makes such wonderful patterns with the light and the dark mm. on the shapes of the stone. I find Portland very drear and monochromatic in grey weather. But when the sun shines and the clear whiteness of the stone against the blue sea is very beautiful. As well as being beautiful, the, it's so clear cut. And that is the watercolour, it appeals to me. It's the drawing in it, the drawing of the shapes of the stones. And I do like that sort of primeval sternness of Portland very much. Nearly everyone works and thinks hard good stone and hard good stone breeds hard good character. The old Portlanders themselves were very thrifty people. Money was very tight. And an old aunt of mine, I used to, uh, when I was younger, I rather um, disliked her because she was so, as I call it, mean. But uh, when I got older, I spoke to her about this, questioned her about it, and said, you see, you see, I said, I can't agree with you. I can't say that I like you or any of your kind because you're so tight-fisted with your money. Well, she said to me, son, there's a reason for it, you know. I said, is there? She said, yes. She said, I remember the first penny I had. I was 15 years of age. That was given me by a complete stranger for doing an errand. But she said, you know what my greatest treat was as a girl? I said, no. She said, I used to go to Easton for my mother, walk across the fields with a tin of black syrup. And to dip my fingers in that black syrup was my weekly treat. No one knew, but I used to take the lid off and dip my fingers in. And I didn't know what it was to have a penny till I was 15 years of age. So you see, in them times, things were very tight for me. But there's another, quite a good one, the... Uh, it goes something like this. The old Portlanders years ago, they never used to shave only once a week unless they were going somewhere special. Well, in the old chap, there he'd been very ill and he died. And his wife thought that being as he died on a Friday and he hadn't had a shave since the previous Saturday, it would be just as well if she sent him to his grave with a decent shave. So she sent for the barber and he came over before he started operations, she asked him how much it would be. He said one and six. He explained to her the loss of business and other things, you see. She said yes. She pondered the matter over a minute or two and the price and uh, decided that she wouldn't have it done. Because as far as she knew, he wasn't going anywhere special. And they didn't go anywhere special very often. They stayed on the island. Well, if I say... We go back 
100 years, I don't suppose there's hardly one in 100, ever went outside of Portland, with the exception, perhaps, of Dorchester Fair, which was the uh, 14th of February. See? That was all day in Portland. All right, many of them in those days didn't know there was another place outside of Portland. <laughs> no, it's <was> true. <laughs> and uh, I knew one chap, I knew him very well. As a boy, and he went away from here, mine, and he got on very well. But when he was a boy, we were out fishing one night, and my, I don't know him, him was out there, he said, Mr. Smith, he said, who did that land over there belong to? That's the St. Albans Head there, see, you can't see it now, because it's too thick. Father said, that belonged to England, Jimmy. me. What, he said, tis a mighty girt place, and isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but some things haven't remained on the island. The animals have gradually diminished in number as the stone quarries slowly encroached. There used to live here a special breed of sheep, the Portland sheep. Oh yes, we, the, the island was famous for its mutton. Now, in the early days, the quarry owners here, every Christmas, used to order so many sheep to be killed and cut up and sent away to their customers. It would be, uh, it, was, it was certainly a very beautiful little lamb, nothing nice so big as a South Down. And uh, we kept them here until, as they say, shouldn't these any more than 40 years ago that they were, mm. the last was taken up the Dorch and sold. Mm. And how does your memory serve you regarding the flavor of these sheep? Oh, the, uh, the, the Portland mutton, I, I've never tasted anything like it. I don't know why it should be because uh, they weren't specially fit in that sort. But uh, we went more by the opinions of the people outside to whom this mutton was sent. But there's another animal that lives on Portland, a small furry creature that lives underground. It's just as well not to mention it by its real name because a good deal of superstition surrounds this little animal. Even today, this superstition is so strong amongst some of the islanders that its name is never mentioned. If what you're thinking about is underground mutton, which, which that's what you've got to call it, uh, you mustn't mention the crack name, because if you mention the crack name, well, then uh, there are some quarrymen now who would prefer to go home than carry on working. If they saw any underground mutton? Not if they saw them, but if anybody happened to mention the name, that's uh, the danger part. You mustn't say the name, not the crack name. Long ears, we'd have called them. We still got a little bit of superstition about them. You don't like to hear tell them? No, not to uh, furry. Well, we... Well, they rang to Roy from a long year ago. Somebody got killed or something, uh, you know, with one mucking about over the top of the quarry head, and uh, ever since that, been taboo here, mm. talking about them. Mm. Well, there's a lot about now. I don't like them at all, you know, not mm. talk about them. Don't mind eating them, but as we talk about I don't want it. Mr. Stone, are there any sort of superstitions that you know of attached to the sea? Oh, yes, there are a few. Such as what? Well, <laughs> well, I wouldn't mention the word, not for hundred pounds. If you put hundred pounds on the seat of that boat I, and said I could have it, I wouldn't mention the word. The word? Mm. Yeah, this is the word that we all know about. That's right, yeah. Yeah, around about, yeah. That's right. The word that's often referred to by another word. That's quite true, yeah. And you, you seriously wouldn't mention it. You try me. I haven't got a hundred pounds. I got a fiver. Try me with that. There you are then. There's a, there's a fiver. Well, there he is. He's still there. I'd go a lot higher than that. I see that you like to be on the safe side. That's right, yes. I don't blame you. <laughs> And the word you mustn't say, of course, is These superstitions are probably a hangover of days gone by when dark and strange things happened in Portland. This island was at one time riddled with believers in witchcraft. Now, the people of Southwall, when they joined, as you probably heard, the New Methodist Movement, mm -hmm. they decided that uh, they'd like to along and they did and they formed a society at Southall and they hadn't been in it very long before the local incumbent found out that they were practicing besides their religious doctrines and practices they were practicing witchcraft. Now this wasn't allowed and uh, 
So, of course, he told them about it, and uh, they withdrew their membership. They withdrew their membership from the local chapel and built a chapel themselves where they could practice not only their religious beliefs, but witchcraft. And the local wits dubbed it Conjurer's Lodge. And uh, they couldn't altogether grasp this new kind of religion that did away with every form of mysterious happening that they couldn't account for. It was reasonable. They wanted to be sure both ways. They wanted to be sure both ways. And it wasn't till they were sure both ways that they gave up going to Conjurer's Lodge. No wonder that when Wesley visited Portland, he wrote a hymn that goes, Come, O thou all victorious Lord, thy power to us make known. Strike with the hammer of thy word and break these hearts of stone. Hearts of stone? No, not now. Portland has changed in heart a good deal since the turn of the century, when the grim Portland prison housed some pretty desperate criminals. They were taken out to work in the quarries, in chains, and one of the morbid pastimes of visitors to Weymouth was to come and watch the convicts doing their hard labour. They used to come up in these uh, breaks, as we used to call them, these are drawn breaks, up to uh, watch the convicts. And some would uh, would walk around, you see, instead of riding up, some would walk. Well, then mm. they, 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 we used to have a few old people that used to, to uh, entertain themselves and be acting as a guide, you see, and, and perhaps pick up a shilling or anything like that from the telly, like I might meet you, you see, and tell you the tale, they show you around a bit, and you'd give me a bob or a couple, you see, got a shilling in them days, you know, about 50 years ago was a shilling, different what he is today. And I, I can remember myself, from, we had some people from Birmingham here at one time, and, uh, and they badly wanted to be, get as close to the convicts as we could, you see. Well, we went, out, we went uh, for a walk all the way, uh, all the way round till we come in where I know the convicts I had to pass, coming out of the quarries in, and going into the prison. And we got there just at the, well, at the arranged time, when the convicts were just going in, in off uh, duty or work from the quarries, you see. And we were riding among the convicts then, you see. Did you ever have any of the convicts working with you? Oh, no, they worked they in their were... own quarries. I see. Oh, yes, they, their, their quarries were all... Uh, or what we call the convict quarries now in the grove, they was all walled in and, and guards with rifles and all that all around, you see. That's in the day, but we ain't talking about that when the old laggers were here, when someone was chained together and all that kind of thing when they'd march in and out, you know. The convicts built the church that stands close by the prison. They started the work on the church and it was completed in 1872 and consecrated in 1872. Mm. And there's some rather nice mosaic there, isn't there? Oh, yes, that was done by Constance Kent. She murdered her half-brother, and she was sentenced to life imprisonment. And she was housed at Dorchester, and she was brought here every day to do the mosaic pavement. And all the tiny little bits of stone were put in with her fingers. Do you get a lot of visitors up here? Oh, yes, thousands in the summer. Of course, you see, anywhere where you get criminal technologies, we'll say, mm. you get the public. People seem to like to see this, don't they? Yes. Well, of course, I think with this, our wonderful church up there, I think it's, there's good in the worst of us and bad in the best of us. But they built that lovely church. And there's a wonderful text in there. It says, Render unto them a recompense, O Lord. I'm on one of the brass plates in the church. And I think that's a wonderful thing to think about. Mm. All those wicked men made that wonderful church of ours. It's odd to think of Constance Kent putting in all those little stones to pay for her sin, and all the convicts hacking out all those great stones to pay for their sins. But the prison is no longer a prison as such. It's changed a little. It's a borstal. But Portland has changed a good deal in many ways. But in others, well, it'll take a long time. It'll take a long time before Portland has stopped using nicknames. Tinny. They call you Tinny. Yes. Why? Well, everyone in Portland goes by a nickname. The reason why we have nicknames, and there are so many Sansoms, my name incidentally is Sansom, there are so many Sansoms, Pierce of Stones, and uh, Portland names such are, as those, that uh, if someone mentioned Reg Sansom, 
the first thing they would say, well, which red sandstone do you mean? Or which sandstone were you talking about? By, by mentioning a nickname, such as Tinny, everyone knows straight away. Of course, that was my father's nickname, and uh, that's handed down. Why was he called Tinny? Well, I can't tell you that. There were three brothers. One was called Yank, one Legs, and one Tinny. <laughs> You've got to find nicknames for everybody, but I just can't tell you why. What other nicknames are there on the island? I just can't think offhand, but there, there's nobody without a nickname. If you want to know any particular person, uh, if you just mention his nickname, I could put my hand on him, but I couldn't without you mention his nickname. But uh, there's odd names, uh, such as Old Yarns, Piggy, uh, Pepper Box, uh, anything like that. Mm. They all refer to various families, like. Fancy having a nickname, Pepper Box. And I wonder what unguarded moment brought one Portlander the nickname, I view the landscape or. Level back room! The back room! The back room! Level back room! And what Level strange noise is this floating across the, the stony room. landscape? Where's my back room? Where's my back room? It's the fish seller. That's a good full-throated bellow you got there. How long have you been in training? Well, so you mightn't believe me, but ever since I was 12 year old, I've been shouting. Yeah. And I'm going into uh, 68 years of age. I'd be 68 on the 28th of May. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I've done it almost all my life. What were you shouting from the age of 12? Well, he's on a note fresh air and codfish or mackerel. Mm. Uh, Fiddity place, lemon soles. Try had it, kept us a mob bloaters. We yeah. didn't care what it was, we had to shout it all out, you see. Yes, and certainly day day you could shout out errands, a penny each, twelve a bub. So we used to carry on, and sprats, tuppence a pound. I've even sold sprats a penny a pound. Have you? That's a God's truth. Uh. And I've even sold fresh errands, so low as sixpence a dozen. And mackerel, the mackerel what we're selling today, we got to charge a shilling and one and two four. I sold them a penny each, and the lady come out and said, well, I'll have a dozen mackerel, we are, I'll just one for the baby. And that's how we used to do it. But no, you've got to shout, you've got to sell them. Instead of shouting a penny each, now you can't shout no price, else it won't come out, you see. Because if you shout one and fourpence a pound, they'll never come out. Won't they? No, but if you was to oh, you could shout out like six a bob or anything like that. Well, they come out like lightning. Mm. Yes, but where we used to, one time we could sell a thousand of mackerel, you can't sell them on about six tone now. Things have certainly changed for the fish seller. And what other changes can Portland expect? How long will it be before all the stone is wrenched away from the island? Some are not very optimistic. They say that the best has been taken and what's left won't last long. Others say that there's stone there for hundreds of years yet. But whatever happens, Portland stands there, heavy and tremendous. It looks as though it'll last forever. It's very difficult to describe. The sea's in a turmoil in the race, just off the bill. The mists creeping around the lonely lighthouse. In that recorded edition of Coast and Country, Johnny Morris was looking at the island of Portland in Dorset. The programme was produced in our Plymouth studios by John Blunden. <laughs>